Welcome to the Allegheny East Conference of Churches. Let me say first, shortly, 
we met when we both worked as teachers in the same school. Yes, we first knew each other during high school, but since we lived in different villages in different states, we hardly got to meet each other. But after she finished her college, she came to my village to take care of her uncle and later ended up to work as a teacher while I also was teaching. And soon we started dating and decided to get married towards the end of the year in 1992. We love eating together and going out together and just talking as a family. And uh, ever since our true children moved out to study in different states, we enjoy traveling together as a family. And we also like taking road trips across different states. My husband always does the best that he can. And uh, as he, as uh, a teacher in before and now as a pastor, and I admire that um, about about him, and he is always very dedicated to his work. As for me, what I love and like the most about my wife is her love for God. And uh, I would say that the reason why our two, ch our two children are following God and serving Him in the church is because of my wife. And uh, for how she did, depended on God. Our son, uh, Rosang Puyafanai, is a pastor in Hawaii Conference. And uh, our daughter, Rebecca Fanai, is a nurse working at Adventist Hospital at White Oak Medical Center while serving as children ministry leader in our local church. I give the credit to my wife in the way that uh, she still instill the fear of God in them. And you know, my wife is not a kind of person who stand before the congregation and speak, but her prayers and dedications to the Lord are the greatest support that I can ever receive. We met many years ago um, at a church that we were both worshiping in Kenya, where his dad was pastoring and we were in the same youth group. And uh, the rest is history, they say. <laughs> yeah, I remember, you know, trying to convince Barbara to join the youth group, the youth choir, especially. Uh, she was hesitant at first, but, um, you know, later she joined. I wanted to discover that she has a gift, uh, especially in singing. Now, I, I kind of had a feeling that um, this was going to be uh, more than a friendship. And um, we, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that through that chance meeting ended up in a, a relationship for life. Barbara is a woman of prayer. She has a, a relationship with God, a living relationship with God. She uh, spends time in prayer, talking with God, reading the word. And um, I don't have a problem consulting her on issues, whether they be family-based or, or ministry-based, because I know that she will spend time in prayer talking to God and just getting her perspective. Uh, she's very sympathetic and empathetic. Uh, she loves people genuinely. Um, personally, I think when you have those two things, uh, you know, your, your, your heart is in the right place, especially when it comes to people, you will make the right decisions in many situations. And so I like that about her. And man, I could go on and on and on. Um, but I just like the fact that she's also very forgiving uh, because I, I, I need a lot of forgiving. <laughs> um, 
Thank you. Thank you for being very kind and, and for those kind words that you have said. Um, I'll pick a few of the many, many things that I like about you. Um, first of all is your love for Christ and your passion for God. Um, that's something that drew me to you many, many years ago. And I continue to be drawn to you because of the fact that you are passionate about God. Um, the other thing I would say is the fact that you are very positive. Um, even in the most discouraging situation, you find something positive in it. And that just, you know, there's never a down moment with you. Um, you always feel like ah, everything is possible. You find a way to encourage me and many people around you. I like the fact that you are um, passionate and respectful um, and you take your relationships with other people very um, important you take them to heart and that's um, among the things that I, that makes me really love you and continue to, to love you. Thank, thank you it's very kind very kind. We love um, traveling um, new places, uh, new people, new experiences. Uh, I think those are very important and we love doing that especially with our children. We also um, love going for walks and, um, you know, nature, just spending time in nature as much as we can and as much um, as, as much time can allow. Um, there are some things that I like doing that Barbara maybe doesn't like so much, but she has learned to, um, uh, you know, to work with me, uh, watching those games, uh, <laughs> sports. Uh, and there's some things that she likes doing and that I've learned to also uh, love doing as well and uh, but at the uh, at the forefront you know we want to keep our, our children happy and try to give them very good experiences as they grow up sure I think I will you know you hit it right on um, just you know spending time in nature and now that the kids are growing up just trying to find out that thing that the kids love to do the most um, and so we just find a way of hanging out with them mm -hmm. and and just you know, do, trying to do it with them. Mm -hmm. We are grateful uh, for this um, opportunity, uh, for this ordination experience. Uh, we see it as a yet another milestone, not just in ministry, but also as a family. But we see this as a, as a higher calling that we do not take for granted in way, shape, or form. And we're just grateful for many friends who have been supportive throughout the years. And just just, just grateful to God for them. Personally, I'm also grateful for my wife, Barbara, who has been very supportive throughout the years uh, for us even to get to this place. I think we're just humbled um, truly for the opportunity to serve um, to serve where we are right now and just to be able to to have an opportunity to be exposed to other um, opportunities to serve elsewhere um, we thank God it's just an opportunity to serve and we cannot be more honored than we are right now we're grateful good evening and happy Sabbath I invite you to pray with me as we welcome God's presence into this sacred service Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this evening on this Holy Sabbath day with praise and thanksgivings for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us throughout this entire encampment. And now we simply beseech for your august presence to rest upon this place. I'm asking Lord that your Holy Spirit will abide and dwell in the hearts of our ordinands as well as their spouses and their entire families. And then as you did with the children of Israel of old, were you led and guided by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night and welcomed and issued your presence and the holy Shekinah glory. Manifest yourself this evening. May you be seen, heard, felt, believed, so that when we leave this place, we will be equipped and armored with the power and the might of all heaven. 
Bless us now and please attend to the future labors and success of these your men servants is my prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Today's Bible reading is taken from Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 1 through 5. La lectura bíblica de hoy es tomado de Jeremías, el capítulo 1 y los versículos del 1 al 5. La palabra de Dios lee de la siguiente manera. Las palabras de Jeremías, hijo de Gilcías, de los sacerdotes que habitaban en Anatot, de la tierra de Benjamín. Las palabras de Jehová que vino a él en los días de Josías, hijo de Amón, rey de Judá, en el año décimo tercero de su reinado. Versículo 3. Fue asimismo en días de Joacín, hijo de Josías, rey de Judá, hasta el fin del año unidécimo de Sedequías, hijo de Josías, rey de Judá, hasta la cautividad de Jerusalén en el mes quinto. Versículo 4. Vino pues palabra de Jehová a mí diciendo, Antes que te formaste en el vientre te conocí, y antes que salieses de la matriz te santifiqué, y te di por profeta a las naciones. Que Dios añada sus bendición a su palabra. Muchas gracias. I will read Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7 in Korean. 또 보니 다른 천사가 공중에 날아가는데 땅에 거하는 자들 곧 여러 나라와 족속과 방언과 백성에게 전할 영원한 복음을 가졌더라. 그가 큰 음성으로 가로되 하나님을 두려워하며 그에게 영광을 돌리라. 이는 그의 심판하실 시간이 이르렀음이니 하늘과 땅과 바다와 물들의 근원을 만드신 이를 경배하라 하더라. We are going to read the word of God in French. Nous lisons la parole de Dieu en français. 2 Timothée chapitre 4, les versets 1 à 5. Je t'en conjure devant Dieu et devant Jésus-Christ qui doit juger les vivants et les morts et au nom de son apparition et de son royaume. Prêche la parole, insiste en toute occasion, favorable ou non, reprend, censure, exhorte avec toute douceur et en instruisant. Car il viendra un temps où les hommes ne supporteront pas la saine doctrine, mais ayant la démangeaison d'entendre des choses agréables. Ils se donneront une foule de docteurs selon leurs propres désirs, détourneront l'oreille de la vérité et se tourneront vers les fables. Mais toi, sois sobre en toutes choses, supporte les souffrances, fais l'œuvre d'un évangéliste, remplis bien ton ministère. Amen. I'll be reading the scripture in one of the Ghanaian languages. Chi. Lucas 3 et 9. En et a radin hum hum a woman so. Nainty was srammy say, Me meka a sempa minchre a hiafu. Wasuma me say, Me meka or jeer minchre a no moon, any a de hum minchre a nifrafu. Nami me jawana wa peche wano a quine. Nami meka a radi any so a fringia. Amen. Our scripture is taken from Romans chapter 10 starting with verse 13. And here is what the word of the Lord says. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things.
Pastor Royal L. Harrison grew up in Redlands, California. Though he was born in Rome, New York, his parents moved to California when he was five years old. His father was in the military and was stationed at Norton Air Force Base in San Bernardino. His parents joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church when he was seven years old, and they were faithful members of the K Street SDA Church for many years before transferring their membership to the Mentone SDA Church, where their membership remained until their deaths. Pastor Harrison attended public school in his elementary and high school years, and upon graduating from high school a year later, enlisted in the United States Air Force. Pastor Harrison served in the Air Force for four years, and while enlisted, he married the former Dominique Paula Crushenberry. God has blessed them with two wonderful children. Two years after being honorably discharged from the United States Air Force, Pastor Harrison enrolled at Oakwood University to study theology. After enduring many life-changing experiences, the Holy Spirit began working on his heart until he surrendered and enrolled into Oakwood University in 1989, and then went on to Andrews University for his seminary study, and began his public and professional ministry in the Southeastern California Conference in Riverside, California, at the Kansas Avenue Seventh-day Adventist Church. God has blessed Pastor Harrison, allowing him to preach in many places, including the beautiful country of the Philippines, Thailand, and Kenya, Africa. Pastor Harrison has had the privilege of speaking for conferences, special events, and graduations, and is always humbled and honored by these invitations. Pastor Harris tries to live his life in such a way that his living will be a reflection of the grace and mercy of God and his gratefulness for God's unconditional love and saving power.
It is a great honor and privilege to be a part of this awesome and, and sacred ordination service. I want to thank the ordination committee and my dear friend, Dr. Gene Donaldson, a man whom I love and appreciate and admire. But someone I've been trying to steal from y'all for five, over five years, and he just will not leave. I want to thank him for his gracious and kind invitation to be his, to speak a word on behalf of your ordination service. As you officially recognize and affirm these two ordinees and welcome them into the fellowship and awesome responsibilities of the office of the ordained ministry. I rejoice in the fact that your administration and leadership still recognizes the sacredness and the solemnness of this ecclesiastical occasion. And that it is not to be taken lightly, nor is it to be seen as just another ritual or formality, but it is to be honored and treasured and valued and cherished. More than just some custom that we ceremoniously perform, but a, a spiritual solemn commemoration where the celestial and the terrestrial come together and God himself through the anointing of the Holy Spirit places a divine calling upon one's life. And today we are here to witness and affirm that calling upon the lives of Moses, Jaguna, and Larufwe Fanai. I can still remember the day in which I was ordained, the solemn of, uh, solemnness of the moment, the sacredness of the events, the heaviness of the words, and the weight of not only the responsibility, but also of the expectations that now come with being an ordained minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, up until then, I was just an intern, but now I'm an ordained pastor. Up until then, I wasn't expected to know a whole lot, but now I was expected to know everything. Up until then, I would be the only one glaring at my mistakes, but now it seemed as though my mistakes were glaring back at me. Up until then, I was expected to be poured into, but now I was expected to pour into someone else. Up until then, I was expected to give a word every now and then, but now I was expected to be an example of that word living in me. Up until then, my life was my own, but now my life no longer belongs to me. And brothers and sisters, up until then, I thought I was qualified, but now I realize how unqualified I was. And that's what I want to share with you, Pastor Jaguna and Pastor Fanal. As we prepare to ordain you, I want you to always remember that you don't have what it takes for ministry. But what you do have is a God who does have all that it takes. And for the, these next few minutes, I'd like to just simply speak from the subject entitled, Ministry Demands More Than Any of Us Can Give. Let me say that again. Ministry demands more than any of us have to give. Would you pray with me? Our most kind and gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus. God, we invite your presence to be with us in this service. Bless our time together. Touch and anoint these two preachers. God, you have called them for such a time as this to work on your behalf to the building up of your kingdom. Now, Lord, we pray that as they are ordained on this day, that, Lord, that they will never turn from working in the vineyard as you have set them that as they place their hands on the plow, that they will never turn back. And that God, as they continue to build and minister to your people, we pray that you will bless them with great success. We thank you, God, for this moment and this opportunity. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I would like to use as our scripture text, Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. The Bible says this. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea, Philippi, 
He was at, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they said, some say that you're John the Baptist. Others say that you're Elijah. And still others say that you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But Jesus, not satisfied with that answer, said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. To both of our pastors, our preachers, you have demonstrated great gifts intellectually, pastorally, even theologically. Pastors, I'm sure you have left your mark on your churches in which you now serve or have served. You have learned to do pastoral care by text message, email, Zoom, Facebook, and Twitter. You have obviously learned how to pretend not to be bored and to look engaged and attentive at all of your pastors and conference official meetings. You have learned how to create liturgies and write sermons, prepare messages, share board meetings and business meetings. You've extended grace and perhaps you've even had to learn how to forgive. Top of all of that, adding to all of your schooling, all of your training, all of your gifts. If I were to ask either one of you, are you prepared for the gospel ministry? The only answer that would satisfy that question is absolutely not. You see, what I've come to learn in my 20-something years of ministry is that with all of the gifts, with all of my schooling, with all of my experience, and with all of my training, I still don't have what it takes to do ministry. Because I've learned in this thing called ministry that it isn't about what I have, it's all about who has me. It isn't about what I can do, it's all about what can God do through me. It isn't about what I bring to the table, it's all about allowing God to set my table. Now I'm so glad that even though I may not have what it takes, that I serve a God who does have what it takes. And I'm just stopped by to remind you that God never calls great men and women into ministry. He simply calls and equips ordinary men and women that they may do great things for him in ministry. Our text talks about Peter. Jesus chose Peter, Peter of all people. I would imagine that Peter would have a difficult time getting ordained in most of our conferences today. I mean, he was a loud mouth, talking when he should have been listening, flying off the handle, saying stuff inappropriately. I mean, come on, Peter? I mean, seriously, the guy who talked all that stuff when he thought he had an army behind him. He was ready to fight then, but when he was all by himself, he denied Christ three times. Jesus, Peter, the son that saw you walking on water and said, if that's you, Jesus, let me come out to you. I mean, come on now. He knew that it was Jesus. I mean, if he thought it was anyone else but Jesus, he never would have gotten out of the boat. He knew it was you, Jesus, but he just wanted to flex in front of his boys. And then the real Peter came out again when he started drowning. So really, Jesus, you're going to establish your church on him? I mean, if this would have come to a vote in one of our conference ordination committees, Peter would have had a hard time getting ordained. I mean, who in their right mind would have given Peter a church, much less have given him, made him the rock in which the church would be established? Jesus can't choose one of the other. Couldn't you choose one of the other disciples? Anyone but Peter. Well, maybe anyone besides Peter and Judas, because Judas had some issues too. But Jesus chose Peter. And when I look at this thing at first, it just didn't make sense to me. Why would Jesus choose Peter? This loud mouth, speaking out of turn, arrogant, profanity-using, finger-pointing fishermen. 
But then God said, look again. And when I looked at it again, I saw what this thing was all about. Listen to me. It wasn't that Jesus had the perfect guy that it took to lead the church. It said Peter had the perfect God that it took to lead the church. Did you get it or did you miss it? This thing wasn't about Peter. It was about Jesus. There are no perfect pastors. There are no perfect assignments. There are no perfect churches. There are certainly no perfect members. But we serve a perfect God, a God that calls us and equips us and prepares us that we might be used by him. And brothers, brother pastors, I just stopped by to remind you that the people you serve, whether it's in the church or in the community, whether it's in the home or a street corner, whether it's at the doctors or, or to the homeless, People need the Lord. They don't need what you have as much as they need the God who has you. And while I'm in this neighborhood, let me share this with your peace preachers. Your greatest power is the power of your example and not the example of your power. Can somebody say amen? So I'd like to suggest that Jesus didn't choose Peter because he was the first to confess Christ. Because after all, Peter... Peter's moment of glory lasted all about 10 seconds before he said something so stupid that Jesus had to say to him, get thee behind me, Satan. I don't think that Jesus chose Peter because Peter understood everything or because Peter was clever or because Peter had the best prayer life or because Peter had the mildest personality and he just seemed like a pastor. No, no. I don't think Jesus chose him because of his loyalty. But here's a question. What if Jesus chose Peter, not in spite of the denial, but because of the denial? What if Jesus chose Peter so that Peter might be, might be able to represent folks like you and I, people who don't have what it takes for the ministry, people who don't have all it all together, men and women who are not qualified, men and women who otherwise would have been overlooked and not even considered? What if Peter represents those of us who have nothing to offer, but like Peter, when he was converted, said to the lame man, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto thee. And in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. What Peter reminds us of is that our greatest gift is not our skill set. It is not our book knowledge. It is not our talents. It is not our preaching. It is Jesus. Give me Jesus. For Jesus says, if I be lifted up, don't get it twisted, preachers. You are not called into the ministry for such a time as this to give flowery sermons and pontificate on some intellectual level that no one understands. No, no. You have been called for such a time as this to blow the trumpet and to give a certain sound, letting everybody know that Jesus is coming soon. And then Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says to Peter, I am entrusting you uh, with the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Young preachers, I understand that. I want you to understand the gravity of Jesus' statement to Peter. The weight of the responsibility uh, of being entrusted with the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What a solemn responsibility that we have as preachers. And the sooner you and I acknowledge that we don't have what it takes in order to handle that, the sooner we will realize that God didn't call us because he's in need of us. God called us because we need him. Listen, I'm not too ashamed to tell you that the ministry not only saved me, but the ministry is saving me even right now. I had a professor in the religion and theology department at Oakwood University that always said, if you can do anything besides ministry, you ought to go and do that. Then he would say, if you tried everything and ministry keeps calling you back, then you ought to do that. But my problem wasn't either one of those situations. Hear me now. My problem wasn't that I felt that I couldn't do anything else. And my problem wasn't that I had tried other things and kept coming back to the ministry. My problem was that I knew that if I ever left the ministry, that I would lose my soul. God has used the ministry to anchor my soul in him. 
That's how much he wants to save me. Listen, there are some things I don't do simply because I'm in the ministry. I wish you'd hear me. Now, I know that some of y'all may be looking at me funny, but if the truth be told, some of y'all don't do some things uh, now that you used to do before, uh, because not, not only because you don't want to, or only because you're too old to do them anymore. Some of y'all don't go to some of the places that you used to go to because it just wouldn't look right for a 70-year-old man to be in that place. It isn't because you don't have, you don't want to go, or you don't want to do it, uh, but because you have gotten too old to do it. Listen, I've learned to thank God for victories in however and in whatever it comes. Somebody ought to shout amen. I, Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Preachers, listen, here's my last uh, thing here. Bind uh, uh, your people in prayer before the Lord. We are called to be both prophets and priests. We are called to stand before God to mediate on behalf of the people. And sometimes we are called to stand before the people to mediate on behalf of God. Pray for your members, love your members, care for your members, bind your members and present them before God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. But finally, all preachers, preach the word. Preach the word in season and out of season. Preach the word in good times and in bad times. Preach the word when you're, when you're happy and when you're sad. Preach the word when the church is full and when it's empty. Preach the word when the people are shouting and when they're quiet. Preach the word until darkness turns to light. Preach the word until sadness turns to joy. Preach the word until despair gives way to hope. Preach the word until doubt gives into faith. Preach the word until lies submit to the truth. Preach the word until the weak become strong. Preach the word until he that will come shall come. Preach the word until the last song has been sung. Preach the word until the last scripture has been read. Preach the word until all the saints come marching home. Preach the word until the trumpet sounds. And when you have done all that you can do, uh, preach the word. Let me be one of the first to congratulate both of you as you rise to the next level in ministry. And my prayer for you is that you will have a productive and inspiring and kingdom building ministry as God would have it to be. And as I take my seat, I encourage you both to enjoy your ministry. Find your space to get, a, get away from the grind of ministry and always find ways to refresh yourself in ministry. And remember, you weren't called because you have what it takes, but because you are connected to the God who has what it takes. May God bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face to always shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And give you peace. Our Father and our God, we pray for your anointing even right now. I pray, O oh God, that you will anoint these men from the tops of their heads to the soles of their feet. Bless them, O oh God, as you can only do. Use them. Equip them. But most of all, God, save them. And save those in whom they have labored for. Lord, we turn them and place them in your hands. They don't belong to us, but they do belong to you. My prayer, oh God, for them is that as they labor for us, don't let them be cast away. Save them and their families. I do pray in Jesus' name that everyone say, Amen and amen. May God richly bless you and bless this service. Amen.
President Henry Fordham, to our Vice President for Administration, Pete Palmer, to our Vice President for Finance, Lawrence Martin, to the area leaders and ethnic coordinators, to all of my fellow laborers who have taken the sacred oath, to the constituents, members of the Allegheny East Conference. It gives me great pleasure on this, the second day of July, in the year of our Lord, 2021, to present the newest members of the Allegheny East Conference pastoral team to receive the highest honor and affirmation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our ordinance over a period of years have given satisfactory evidence of character traits, values, and core competencies associated with the standards of the Seventh-day Adventist pastoral ministry. They have passed a rigorous review of their theological orthodoxy and commitment to the Seventh-day Adventist church by their peers. They have received the vote of endorsement 
from the Allegheny East Conference Executive Committee, and they have duly ratified and been confirmed by the Columbia Union Conference. And having given proof of their calling to the gospel ministry, it is my pleasure today to welcome our candidates for ordinance, ordination to the gospel ministry. Pastor Moses Jaguna and Pastor Laura Pua Fanai. Would you join me at the rostrum? Um, well, I have many hobbies and interests, uh, but I usually gravitate towards those uh, stress relievers for me. I like to play some music, I play some instruments. I also like running uh, a lot. That's usually one of my uh, best activities. I also like uh, reading, you know, just leisure reading. So I find those being very uh, stress relieving for me. And I appreciate that. So um, I grew up in a pastoral family. My dad is a pastor. I have two younger brothers. And what I remember from a young age is moving from one church to another, moving from one place to another, and also moving from school to school and having to make new friends every year. And I knew for me, if I had to make a choice, pastoral ministry was not for me. So in high school, I remember having that distinct sense that probably ministry will be something that I may have to do at some point. I, um, I was asked to serve as one of the leaders in the school. And it was during that time when I got affirmation from my colleagues, from my teachers. And then as I have lived out my life, for me, th there wasn't one distinct time when I heard the call. It, it has been more of a process uh, which um, has actually been uh, confirmed by many. Yeah. For me, ordination is a very humbling experience because um, it uh, let, lets me know that my colleagues, my leaders, have also noticed and appreciated the gifts that God has placed in me. And so it also gives me a heightened sense of responsibility that um, at the end of it all, God is going to require on my hand to produce fruit based on the skills and the gifts he's placed in me. And so it's a joyful time, but it's also a very solemn time for me, knowing that um, I've, I've been asked to take another role in ministry. It is my prayer that God will make me to be a soul winner, um, to bring many people to Christ. Uh, I feel myself gravitating towards helping those who are hurting. Um, I, I find myself being very fulfilled when someone gets a breakthrough in their life. I believe in the power of prayer, and I've seen prayer do miracles in the lives of many people. In my local church, some of my goals include a ministry training and leadership training. I'd like to see as many people being involved in ministry, everyone from a little child to the oldest, everyone doing whatever they can. And I know it's, it's possible. Um, I have many other goals. But one thing which I keep praying and telling God, asking God rather, is I don't want to be average. And if, if, if he can do whatever he needs to do with me. So I, at the end of the day, I don't want to be average. And um, I don't know what that will entail, but I'm willing to just leave myself in the hands of God and have him do his work in me. First of all, I'm grateful to God for life, for this call to ministry, sustaining up to this point. I'm also grateful to my family, my wife, our children, been very supportive. 
I'm grateful to our conference leadership, our president, Elder Fordham, Vice President Palmer, Vice President for Finance, Elder Martin. Our ministerial director, Dr. Downson, has been very, very helpful uh, in guiding and mentoring. I also want to thank my colleagues in the African Ministerium who have also been very affirming and um, they've, they've helped me a lot. I have many friends who have helped me along the way. Many of them are colleagues in ministry. I'm truly grateful to them. I'm grateful to my family, my, my immediate family, my parents, my dad who is a pastor, um, and my two brothers and their families who have been uh, my bedrock of support. I would be remiss if I didn't mention my church family, Maranatha. Oh, I, I love my church. Uh, we have wonderful time. I have a great team of leaders, my elders, and the entire church family. Just a wonderful, wonderful team. And so I'm grateful uh, to each one of them. You know, I was not born and raised in Seventh-day Adventist Church, but by God's grace, I grew up in the fear of God in the Methodist Church. And I was born again in my teenage years. And I started sharing the love of Jesus Christ as much as I could. But during those times, I did not have any desire or plan to become a pastor. And then when I learned of the three angels message and join the seven Adventist church, the remnant people of the last time, the end time. I began to have a very strong desire to share this message as a full-time minister. And I knew deep in my heart that God has placed a call to be a full-time minister. For me, ordination is, I see ordination as the highest honor and recognition in our church for the service of God. And so it means a lot to me and I do not take it lightly. And since this event takes place only once in the lifetime of a pastor, I'm very glad to God that he has led me to this milestone in my humble service for him. And I see this ordination as a confirmation of the call that, has, that God has placed in my heart in a full time in a full-time ministry. My number one goal in my ministry as a spiritual leader is to lead and guide my church members to Jesus Christ so that they may have eternal life. And uh, I also am very passionate about empowering and encouraging my members to share what the Lord has done for them so that they too can make more disciples. As for my personal spiritual walk, spiritual walk with God, my goal is to walk with Jesus closer each day. I, want, I also want to sharpen my talents and skills that God has placed that God has blessed in me so that I can be the best instrument that I can be for him. First of all, I'm very grateful to God for his call to be in this gospel ministry. And I would like to mention my heartfelt thanks to the administrators of Allegheny's Conference, Elder Henry Fordham, Elder Pete Palmer, and Elder Lawrence Martin. And also to 
Dr. Donaldson, my mentor and my director for their guidance. And I also would like to say thank you so much for to all the Eleganese conference leaders. And last but not the least, I would like to say thank you so much to my local church leaders and my members and my families and friends from ar around the world for their prayers and their support. Thank you so much. Pastor Jagona and Pastor Fanai, your ordination is a public recognition of your divine appointment. For indeed, you have been called to the ministry for such a time as this. You are authorized henceforth to perform the sacred duties of pastors by your own submission to the land on of hands. And in recognition of your call, I now charge you with your sacred duties for them to the fullest extent so that upon the completion of your task you will hear the cheering words well done thy good and faithful servant enter thou into the joy of thy lord i charge thee before god and the lord jesus christ preach and teach the word be instant in season and out of season reprove rebuke exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrines but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. You are in God's place at God's perfect time. He has placed his hand upon you to bless you and make you a blessing to others. God has called you himself and equipped you for ministry. He will shine through you as you continue to follow his leading. Stand for God alone. And all you do, preach and teach the word. May God continue to bless you both. Amen. Pastor Moses Jaguna, Pastor La Rapua Fanai, are you prepared now to take the ministerial pledge? Yes. yes. Acknowledging the sufficiency of God's grace, do you solemnly pledge yourselves before God and in the presence of this congregation to be vessels of honor with a pure heart, clean hands, and uh, with the Holy Spirit's help? Yes. yes. Do you humbly and faithfully desire to work for the salvation of erring souls and for the edifying of the body of Christ? Yes. yes. Will you endeavor to place upon mankind the estimate that God has placed upon them and regard them as precious? Yes. yes. Will you have compassionate compassion for the loss? Yes. yes. Will you labor for souls for the redemption of humanity for our Lord? Yes. yes. Will you ask for wisdom from heaven that as you stand between the living and the dead that you may realize that you are accountable to God 
for the work coming forth from your hands? Yes. yes. Will you feed the congregation of God's with their God's holy word? Yes. yes. Will you do the work of an evangelist? Yes. yes. Will you be a friend and a counselor in the time of need? Yes. Will you plan the work of the church so that your congregation may grow in grace bear fruit in fellowship, will you be a teacher and a witness for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Yes. Will you share with the flock entrusted to you the wisdom and love of God, the knowledge of forgiveness of sin, and the saving grace of Jesus Christ our Lord? Yes. And finally, Will you endeavor to make God big by precept and practice? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. God in heaven, we're thankful today for the laying on of hands of Pastor Fanai and Pastor Moses. We thank you, God, for the call to ministry and this great gospel commission that you have laid on them that they might do the great work of telling a dying world about a living Christ. We're thankful, Lord, for the privilege and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that has been laid upon them, the mantle of responsibility to preach the gospel with great power. We pray, God, that as they assume the responsibilities and the duties of heralds of the gospel, that you will continually endow them with power from the Holy Spirit that you will continue to lay hands upon them as they lay hands upon others, God, as they do a great work with sharing the good news. God, may their labor not be in vain. May the anointing of God continue to pour forth, forth through them. And may the angels that excel in strength and power accompany them, God, and keep them from hurt, harm, danger, incident, and accident. As they wage war on behalf of the Godhead, and as they invoke God, the Spirit of the Holy One, to be with them, I pray, God, that those who hear and are participants in their ministry will be inspired, encouraged, and uplifted. God, we give you praise, honor, and glory for the privilege to welcome these men of God into the gospel ministry. Have your way. Continue to bless them and use them for your glory. And when that great getting up morning comes, May they, as well as us, hear from your lips, O God. Well done, thou good and faithful servants. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. In the wonderful name of Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Good evening. God has truly blessed us during this ordination service, and we've come to the part of the ordination service where we have some gifts for you, and we have some mementos of this uh, occasion. There are two things that I'd like to share with you this evening in terms of mementos. Well, one is a memento and the other is actually a license. Uh, the first is your, order, your certificate of ordination. Um, this is one of the proudest certificates I have. I have degrees from different places, but this certificate is powerful. This certificate means a lot to me because this certificate represents the day that I was inducted into the eldership of the world church. What this says when you are ordained is that you are an elder anywhere you go in the world, not just in the Columbia Union, not just in the Allegheny East Conference, not in just in the North American division, but anywhere you show up in the world, you are an elder of the world church, which is, which is interesting because we talk about local elders and then there's world eldership. Uh, local eldership, everybody understands, but world eldership means that you are an elder any place you show up. In the middle of the night, you are an elder of the world church. And the two of you represent uh, the finest of what we are talking about in terms of eldership for the world church. Welcome to being an elder of the world church. And so this certificate that uh, we're gonna hand you is uh, a representation of that. It, it says, you are now, ordained. God bless you, ordained. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I'm gonna ask that Elder Donaldson will hand these to you and then we're gonna have one more presentation. So Elder Donaldson, if you would hand those to our two 
ordained elders of the World Church. That is a memento that stays on the wall or that hangs in your office um, that you place that someplace prominent uh, so that people know. But these two, these are these are your license. This is your ministerial credentials. When you I keep these in my wallet. Now, I have a number of things in my wallet. I have my driver's license in my wallet. I have an ATM card in my in my wallet. But the card that means the most to me is this card. And the reason why is because every time I pull this out, if I go to a hospital and I want to signify that I am a, a, a pastor um, and that I am duly noted by the Adventist church to be a pastor, this is what I pull out. These credentials are issued every five years uh, when we have a constituency session. Right after the session, we issue a new uh, credentials. Keep your credentials near. But these are not just working papers. These are to be protected. Not protected so much in terms of the actual card. We can always print you a new one. When I say protected, every time you pull this out, you are saying, you're representing, excuse me, the Adventist church. You're representing every other minister. We are one body as ministers of the gospel. And so you must protect this. Protect it with your honor, protect, protect it with your integrity, protect it in the way that you perform ministry. This is our, it's our, my pleasure to share with you your credentials, your ministerial credentials that say you are an ordained minister of the gospel. Also to commemorate this evening, uh, Elder Donaldson has some uh, another set of gifts that he wants to present to you on behalf of Allegheny East Conference. Elder Donaldson. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. It gives me great pleasure to uh, present to you as new members of the family of pastors in the Allegheny East Conference and the World Church a new sword that commemorates uh, this event. It is the Andrews Study Bible, and we hope that this will help you as you feed the flock of God. Pastor Jakuna, Pastor Fanai, Elder Fordham would have loved to have been here. Uh, he may participate in some other ways. Uh, normally, he would have been the one to hand you your ordination certificate. I want to welcome you to the ordained ministry of Allegheny East Conference on behalf of Elder Henry J. Fordham, the third president of Allegheny East Conference, myself, vice president for administration, Elder Lawrence Martin, our vice president, for finance and the executive committee of the Allegheny East Conference. Welcome. Thank you for being part of this fantastic team. Uh, you've already been part of the family. We welcome you to the ordained part of the family. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and congratulations to Pastor Moses and Pastor Fanai. I'm honored to be asked to extend to you as a fellow ambassador of Jesus Christ, welcome to the ranks of the professional gospel ministry with all of the privileges, opportunities, and responsibilities accompanied. This signals, gentlemen, official grafting as co-laborers with the chief shepherd and the grandest enterprise transpiring in the history of the moral universe, restoring mankind and our fallen creation back in harmony with its divine purpose. Our highest duty is to make disciples and to train disciples to make disciples. We have been called to raise hell, R-A-Z-E, 
while at the same time building up the kingdom cause. The master of the vineyard says that the faithful worker will be compensated with a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the gospel ministry. God bless you. Pastor Moses Njuguna, what has taken place tonight is the recognition and affirmation of your ministry in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Ordination comes with responsibilities, but I want to assure you that he who has led you will not leave you nor forsake you. He will continue to equip you for ministry. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate you on your ordination. I also want to welcome you on behalf of your conference and the World Church. Be loyal to its leadership. I welcome you on behalf of your fellow ministers. Let them minister to you. I welcome you on behalf of the congregations you will serve. Shepherd them, for there is no work so pleasant, so rewarding as the work of saving souls. Welcome to ordained ministry. On behalf of the Ministerial Spouses Association of the Allegheny East Conference, we want to welcome Barbara and Maliani, the wonderful spouses of these ordained ministers. We welcome you to ministry. And with this, we offer a simple prayer that in the name of Jesus Christ, that his spirit, the spirit of love, wisdom, and understanding that it will always rest upon you. And we ask that our Father will send you a word every day, whether it be through your husband, your family, your friends, or those that you minister to, that through them, he will send a word to encourage and remind you of your value as a powerful woman of God. And in case you haven't heard it yet, and for the times that you will need to hear it, we thank you for your smile and kindness. We thank you for handling demands and requests with grace. We thank you for being loving. We thank you for all of the energy and sacrifices that you will make for the sake of ministry. We thank you for your personal and financial sacrifice for the kingdom of God. And we thank you for sharing your husband with the church and for supporting him as he serves the body of Christ. We promise to undergird you with prayer. And even now, we thank God for the portion of strength that he will give you as you continue in your life of service to him. May his peace and joy always abound in your heart. God bless you. So send I you to labor on rewarded to serve unpaid, unloved, unsought, unknown, to bear rebuke, to suffer scorn and scoffing. So send I you. To toil for me alone. So send I you to bind the bruised and broken, all the wandering souls to work, to weep, to wake, to bear the blood.
Let us look to the Lord in benediction. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being a part of this occasion that has called us together to see the sacred passing of the torch from one generation to another. And we pray that you will be with those who have accepted this ordination this evening. Now dismiss us from your presence, but not from your care and not from your loving attention until we come to meet you again in your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, our Christ, we pray. Amen.